Wake Up in Paradise, Chapter 4, Cinderella's Ball. There was always extra money to be made by signing up for overtime work. Weekly, the hotel played host to conventions, banquets, tournaments, and various other functions. Anne had not availed herself of any of this bonus money when Pater asked her to sign up for the annual governor's ball. It's only for four to six hours, depending on what job you're doing, and they pay bonus pay. Pay to explain. It's easy money, and if you're a server, you get a tip percentage from the bar. Sure, easy money for y'all. You've done it before. I don't know anything about serving. I drop something for sure and get fired on the spot. No thanks, Andy Klein. You could help in the kitchen. They need all the help they can get, and then some, Peta wheedled, unwilling to take no for an answer. It's a hundred dollars. You could use it. A hundred dollars for a couple of hours? Anne asked skeptically. Yes, and so easy. Even Renault signs up, Peta persisted. I can't see Renault in a kitchen, and laughed at the image of the island Romeo in an apron. <laughs> no, his sister admitted, grinning back. He parks cars and has to stay till all the guests are gone. He loves the excitement of driving all those fancy cars around. But the kitchen help don't have to stay, just the servers and attendants, so you can go home after the banquet. I used to sign up for kitchen, but the servers get more pay. I go for the money now. The opportunity was extremely tempting. It would provide much needed extra money that would add to the savings. In the kitchen, I don't have to go anyplace else, she questioned Peta doubtfully. In the back door and out, Peta encouraged. Come on, say yes. Okay, but it better be as easy as y'all say, Anne relented, and worth it, she added. The hotel kitchen was a cavernous room in what was called a basement by the staff. It actually was on the ground floor of the hotel. Hundreds of meals year-round were prepared there each day for virtual strangers from around the world. Anne avoided the place. It evoked memories of the first few hours after she woke up to find herself in a strange place without a memory. In addition, she only knew a few of the kitchen staff by sight. Arriving for duty, she was very relieved to find that Bertie and Tanya, room cleaning maids that she knew, were busy at work at the salad table. Their presence in the room made her feel less like a stranger. <clears throat> Tonight the hotel was catering to the richest and most influential of the island, the powers that be, as Peta and her family called them, the ones working in charge of all the money and all of the jobs on the island. <clears throat> the di dining room that formerly was a temporary shelter from the hurricane had now been turned into a ballroom. In the hall that Anne remembered from the first night, there were two service elevators to the upper floors. There were also conveyors to the other smaller dining rooms in the hotel. It was a surprisingly efficient arrangement, considering that the hotel was such an old one. Anne spent the next hour peeling and dicing vegetables and fruit, as well as fetching anything some boys cried out that they needed. The busy, seemingly chaotic activity was also exhilarating, and the aroma of the food was wonderfully enticing. Anne realized she had not eaten before coming back to work, and now she realized her mistake. The sight and smell of the artfully arranged and delicious looking food was making her ravenous. As soon as the loaded trays began to go into the conveyor, Joseph, a delicate looking oriental man who seemed to be in charge of the kitchen, 
sent several of the salad line workers to the dishwashing line. Their, their empty trays and dishes were already stacking up. So for the remainder of the night, Ann scraped and stacked into enormous industrial dishwasher, soiled pots and dishes. Autonomy soon took over the task and Ann began to wonder what Peyton and Renault were doing. Tomorrow, she was sure Sally Ray and Natasha, who was serving in the dining room with Peta, were sure to fill her in on all of the glamorous details. Nevertheless, after several hours spent cleaning the kitchen area, Anne became a little envious of her friends. She longed to see the dancing and excitement. She imagined that they were experienced. Perhaps she mused, when she was released to go home, she could sneak around and peek in and get a glimpse of a real royal ball. By the time the cleaning was complete, she was bold enough to put her desire into action. Furthermore, she was not going to be timid and miss her chance to see with her own eyes these rich island residents. At last, bidding good night to the main cooks who were still cleaning grills and grease traps, Anne made her way to the locker room. A few short hours, she was dressed in a crisp white uniform topped by an oversized cotton apron. Now the weary woman looked as food spattered as any of the real cooks. She was also damp from head to toe from spraying trays and unloading wet racks from the dishwasher. Thank God Payday had been a maid and not a kitchen worker, she thought, ruefully, gazing at her image in the mirror. I would not have liked being a permanent kitchen worker. Peeling off the offending attire, Anne stepped into the shower, hoping to get some of the worst of the grime off of her. Fortunately, the soap in the sink dispenser was strong enough not to transfer the kitchen smells to the dress she arrived at work wearing. After dabbing a bit of Maman scented oil to her skin to replace what the drying soap had depleted, she unbound the scarf from her hair that kept the hair clean. Anne shook her hair out of its coil, taking only the time to finger comb and untangle the long waves. Then she surveyed herself critically in the wall mirror, smoothing the ankle length colorful cotton skirt that she discovered was cool and comfortable for walking in the humid heat. Satisfied that she was presentable well, if she happened to meet anybody on the way home, she went to get her sneak peek at the governor's ball. Leaving by the kitchen, by the back door that was left ajar for easy access on this night, Anne made her way toward the area where she could hear music. The strains were so enticing, she knew she would have stopped to listen even if she had not decided to check out the party. Eagerly, despite her weariness, she hurried toward the sounds of music and gaiety. The light blazing from the long windows on the veranda gleaming like a beacon to her. Unable to find the courage to boldly stand at one of the windows and peer in, the young woman hid in the shadows at the edge of the porch. Here, the potted palms etched the stone banister of one of a series of wide, shallow steps leading down into the shrub-lined lawn. Satisfied that she was sheltered from view, she focused her gaze intently through the nearest window that afforded her a clear view of the ballroom. It was like a scene from a lavish movie, and despite being disappointed, that she could discern none of her friends among the servers, the awestruck young woman gazed in delight at the glittering gowns on the beautiful women. The orchestra was out of view. However, couples were dancing to a hauntingly romantic song. The strains that came from the open ballroom doors that had been sounded much like the wind before a storm, soft, and yet building towards strength. It was heavenly. 
While thou thinking of her actions, the enraptured young woman stepped out of her shoes and kicked them aside. As the crescendo of the aria increased, her hands lifted high above her head and she twirled ecstatically until quite dizzy. Dropping her head back, she closed her eyes and lowered her arms, crossing them on her chest as if holding a precious object to her stealth, while still swaying rhythmically to the beautiful music. May I have this dance? A voice intruded into the magical moment and a hand touched her shoulder. Startled, Anne turned so quickly that she became unbalanced. That same hand steadied her and she looked up into the shattered face of an extremely handsome man. The man was of medium height and his sharp bone structure was definitely not the islands. His hair looked dark and the color indistinguishable in the shadows of the porch. However, no amount of darkness could obscure the blue in his eyes. A girl could die happily looking into those eyes, she thought. The man was obviously one of the guests at the ball because he was formally dressed in a black tuxedo, complete with a white cummerbund and tied a match. Oh no, she murmured, embarrassed to be caught surreptitiously dancing on the porch. I ain't a guest. I was only just listening to the music. Indeed, you look like you were having such fun. I long to join you, he said holding out his hand to her and giving her a devastating smile. Oh no, she repeated more firmly. I'm one of the workers here. We ain't allowed to associate with guests. You walk here? The man asked quizzically, his eyes traveling down to rest on her bare feet and then back up connecting with her eyes. Not now, I'm going home, Anne replied in a quavering voice. She smoothed her trembling hands over her dress as if that somehow would make her look less shabby to this elegantly dressed man who had the most charming accent she had ever heard. That is, I was working in the kitchen before now, Anne stammered. Her voice trailed off and she looked at her coral lacquered toenails peeking out from beneath her long skirt in agitation. Then as a courtesy to this guest, please dance with me the man requested in his quaint, clipped way. The elegant man dipped slightly at the waist in a courtly bow and extended his hand out to her a second time. I might lose my job if anybody saw me, Anne whispered, a little frightened, but nonetheless intrigued by the man's persistence. The handsome man ignored her objection. He took her arm and escorted her down the steps and onto the soft grass well out of sight of the brilliantly lit windows. It will be our secret, he whispered in her ear as he took her in his arms and began to move, their bodies in harmony with the music. Mesmerized by the closeness and the perfect way she fit at the right height, Anne laid her hand against the man's shoulder. His embrace was loose, yet he conveyed to her his every change of direction. They moved so naturally together, she knew she had danced before. She also liked dancing with this man very much, so she gave herself over to the magic of the moonlight. You dance very well, he murmured into her hair. When I first saw you dancing in the moonlight, I thought you were a moon nymph, an illusion and found that I was a hotel maid crashing the party, she giggled in response. I am still not certain you are real, he remarked, drawing her closer. Their arms circled each other intimately, as if by mutual consent, and Anne pressed her face into the softness of his jacket. The warmth of him enveloped her like a blanket. The scent of his skin reminded her of the fresh sea air blowing through the tropical trees that bloomed near Papa's farm. She dreamily wondered how he had managed to capture the fragrance in a man's cologne. 
You smell of flowers that grow in the mountains. The whispered words were barely audible, and they shook in to the core. It was if the man had stolen the words from her mind. The two danced further into the shelter of the trees, lost in the magic of the moment. They moved with the sound of the wind in the trees and the rhythm of the waves on the nearby shore, mingling with the strains coming from the ballroom. After what seemed like an endless time, Anne stopped dancing, realizing that she could no longer hear the music from the hotel. They had been dancing for some inner music heard only by the two of them. Now all she could hear was the loud beating of her heart. I gotta go, Anne proclaimed, dropping her arms and moving away from her dancing partner. She did not want to end this wonderful interlude, but this was craziness. She did not know this man, and more to the point, he did not know her. Wait, he protested. Tell me your name. At the request, reality settled upon Anne's chest like a lead shield. She did not want to ruin this perfect time by lying to this man. Moreover, he had given her a new memory to cherish forever. To leave him without an answer would be very rude. The least she could do was to give him a name. Anne, she mumbled. Anne what? he persisted. Anne Pierce, she said a little louder. I really have to go. Thank you for the delightful dance, Anne Pierce, the man said, giving her another courtly bow. And she turned and fled. Anne did not run far. She stopped behind a shrub, watching as the man made his way back to the hotel, feeling much like Cinderella leaving the ball. In one of those rare moments of remembrance, the story came to her. A girl running from the ball at the stroke of midnight, leaving her glass slipper behind. It always baffled Anne why she could remember trivial things like a childish fable when she could not remember important things like her name. She was not like Cinderella at all, she scolded herself. She had, on, she had not been invited to the ball to meet the prince, and the only thing she left behind was her heart. In that instant, as she pondered Cinderella's shoe, she remembered. My shoes, my shoes, she wailed. Anne crept back to the porch and retrieved the forgotten footwear, peering one last time into the windows. She did not, not see her Prince Charming, and disappointed, she started her walk toward the Cheval home.